Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the fifth session in the eight session series on cannabis equity and racial justice. I'm Sarah Michael Gaston with Youth Forward, and this series is hosted by the Alliance for Boys and Men of Color, California Urban Partnership, and Youth Forward. I'd like to take a moment to thank our sponsors. The California Endowment, the Center at Sierra Health Foundation, California Wellness Foundation, Liberty Hill Foundation, California Community Foundation, the Governor's Office of Business and Economic Development, and the California Department of Healthcare Services. Our goal for this convening is to increase awareness about the need to approach all aspects of cannabis policy and the implementation of Proposition 64 from a lens of racial justice and equity. Today, we will focus on local cannabis tax revenues, how cities are allocating funds, and how you can advocate for better use of funds for community needs. For the most part, local governments are spending their cannabis tax revenue on general government and law enforcement. However, this money should be going to community reinvestment, including youth programs, substance abuse prevention and treatment, environmental restoration, and public health initiatives. In this session, we will, have, we will share some research findings from a report we published last summer about California's local governments that have instituted local cannabis taxes. Then we will hear from community organ organizers across the state on their efforts to prioritize local cannabis tax revenues for community reinvestment. I would like to give an overview of state cannabis taxes and local cannabis taxes because there is a difference. Prop 64 set uh, tax state rates on the sale and cultivation of cannabis. As a result, the state is collecting millions of new money, money annually. Prop 64 also designated how those revenues would be allocated with revenues going to fund state infrastructure, grant programs, law enforcement, and other functions. In our second session, we talked about those uh, Prop 64 grant programs. And the Prop 64 um, gave local governments the authority to set their own tax rates on cannabis businesses. Some local governments have chosen to create a local tax on cannabis through placing a measure on the local ballot. Cities and counties are free to spend these new revenues from the cannabis tax however they see fit. In addition, cities and counties are able to place fees on cannabis businesses and in many cases are using developer agreements to bring additional revenue to the local government. I would like to now introduce our first presenter, Jim Freeman, founder and executive director of the Social Movement Support Lab at the University of Denver. For over 15 years with his background in law, he has been working in support of communities of color to create systemic change and support the creation of powerful social movements. He is currently working on releasing a new book titled Rich Thanks to Racism, How the Ultra Wealthy Profit from Racial Injustice. Look out for this book uh, this coming April. Jim did a bulk of the analysis and writing on how local governments are spending cannabis tax revenues and will now share with you the findings from the report. Thanks so much, Sarah. Um, and thank you for the plug for the book. I do appreciate it. Um, hi, everybody. Um, it's great to be here with you. Um, today, like Sarah was saying, I have the pleasure of talking about a report from Youth Forward and the Public Health Institute that I helped to create um, called Cannabis, or I'm sorry, California Cannabis Tax Revenues, a windfall for law enforcement or an opportunity for healing communities. And what we really want to do with the report was really looked to see what was actually happening with local cannabis revenues, how they were being used. And in particular, the question we wanted to answer was, are California cities using local cannabis revenue to repair the heavily racialized harm for the war on drugs and invest in youth development, public health, and equity? And, and really, unfortunately, what we found is, in a word, no, they're not, um, at least not enough. Um, instead, local cannabis revenues have been a windfall for police departments and are instead being used to exacerbate racial inequity and open up new fronts in the war on drugs. So before we get into the specifics of what we found, it may be worth contextualizing these dynamics a bit. So when we say that cannabis revenues are growing the size of police departments and the criminal justice system, that's on top of almost incomprehensible growth that they enjoyed over the past few, few decades. So for example, if we flash back to 1982, California had already built a huge criminal justice system, right? If we adjust for inflation, Californians were spending $12 billion, spent, Californians spent $12 billion that year 
in sort of today's dollars at the local and state level um, on police, prosecutors, jails, prisons, probation, and other aspects of the justice system. So by itself, the California criminal justice system at that time employed 100 and, um, 128,000 people um, and 71,000 just by police and, and sheriff's departments. So this was already a huge, huge system. But nevertheless, California continued to aggressively expand the criminal justice system, due in substantial part to the war on drugs. So by 2015, spending on the criminal justice system had risen by 245% since 1982. And again, that's after adjusting for inflation. So in other words, it more than tripled in size, which produced a $42 billion system employing over 236,000 people. So over 108,000 more people than, um, than, than there were in 1982. And if we look just at police spending um, over that time, the money going towards police departments rose by 177% from 6.3 billion in 1982 to 17.5 billion in 2015, again, adjusting for inflation. So as a result, there were now over 30,000, 32,000 more um, police department employees than there were um, in 1982. So all this is to say, by the time Prop 64 was passed, California already had a dramatically expanded, and I would uh, contend outrageously oversized justice system, which resulted in a far larger role for law enforcement in Californians' lives, including carrying out the mass criminalization and incarceration of many, many more categories of behavior, especially related to poverty, mental illness, homelessness, and perhaps especially drug use. And of course, these in investments into the criminalization of drug use and the severe harm and destruction they caused were overwhelmingly directed at communities of color, making this not only an example of systemic racism, but maybe the quintessential example of systemic racism. So given this context, you can see how Proposition 64 represented a significant change in the landscape, right? Rather on one side, rather than a heavily policed 100% illegal market, all of a sudden wealthy, predominantly white investors had access to a brand new legal and highly lucrative in industry. However, to maximize their profitability, they were going to need help to prevail over their competition um, within the underground economy. Meanwhile, on the other side, you had law enforcement, which faced a post-Prop 64 future in which a significant portion of the rationale for the buildup in their budgets um, was, was eliminated, right? And so um, unless they were able to successfully pivot toward other enforcement activities, they risk being downsized to match their, their reduced responsibilities. So what we really saw was that corporate cannabis and law enforcement were well matched for a post Prop 64 partnership, right? So the cannabis industry, they recruited political heavyweights to work for them. They hired major lobbying firms to push localities in the state to increase enforcement activities on the unlicensed industry. And they engaged in a major, uh, you know, a major PR campaign to demonize that sector. And law enforcement, which has so effectively been able to expand the scope of its responsibilities over the past few decades, was more than happy to oblige in, in committing itself to the next in a long line of tough on crime strategies and, and continue with its war on drugs. So as cities and counties around the state proceeded to pass and implement the local ordinances needed to tax recreational cannabis, the cannabis industry and law enforcement were in prime position to advance their shared interests. So to better understand what this looks like on the ground, um, what we did was research those cities that were the first to pass uh, recreational cannabis ordinances related to Prop 64. Um, and that it actually begun to collect cannabis related revenue by 2018. So what that includes is those cities that passed ordinances in 2016 in anticipation of Prop 64 being, being approved by voters, as well as those that passed ordinances in 2017. And so ultimately this universe of, of cities that we study was 28 cities, some of them very large like LA and Long Beach and, and San Diego, and some very small ones like Point Arena, Woodlake, and, um, and Greenfield. And so the first thing to talk about, um, the first thing to point out um, is that we're talking about a lot of money. This is a lot of revenue coming in. Um, just according to the projections in their city budgets, these cities estimated that they would be bringing in over $85 million from local cannabis taxes in just the 2019-2020 fiscal year. 
Um, I do want to point out also that this research was done about a year and a half ago, um, and I haven't looked back at these cities um, since then, but I would guess that the projections are, are far higher now because most of them were clearly in the process of, of ramping up um, their, their local industries. So where does this money go to? Um, in nearly all these cities, as, as Sarah alluded to, it goes into their general fund, where it's used to pay for various city services. However, for most cities, the largest chunk, by far the largest chunk of their general fund spending um, uh, goes toward the police. So on average for the 20, these 28 cities in our study, police spending represented 39% of general fund spending. And for some cities such as Cloverdale, Modesto and Woodlake, police spending actually represents the majority of their general fund spending. So unless we make an affirmative effort to direct these new revenues, these new resources elsewhere, um, revenues such as these cadmus revenues are going to heavily benefit the police. Additionally, what happened is instead of, act instead of actively seeking to direct these new revenues elsewhere, many jurisdictions are instead explicitly seeking to use cannabis revenues to expand police budgets. So for example, San Diego said that it's decided that the enforcement of marijuana laws and proactively cracking down on illegal operators, in their words, should be prioritized in deploying their cannabis revenues. Um, LA was, um, said it's directing millions of dollars per year in cannabis revenues to the police overtime fund, um, where it's to be used for investigating and enforcing um, uh, laws relative to illegal cannabis businesses, among other law enforcement functions. And the small city of Woodlake, which only has a city police budget of about one and a half million dollars and nine police officers overall, um, said it's using its cannabis revenues to fund an additional officer, a canine unit, and a patrol vehicle. And some cities have gone even, have gone even further in targeting cannabis revenues toward the police. So Shasta Lake, for example, they uh, made their ordinance a special tax, which requires approval um, by two thirds of voters instead of the typical majority, um, which is required for a general tax. And that special tax proposal, proposal stated that all cannabis tax revenue would be used to provide funding to support law enforcement and code enforcement activities. Um, and, and that ordinance passed with 79% of the vote, thus creating a new um, dedicated funding stream for police. So in short, new cannabis revenue has really been a boon for, for law enforcement. Um, and between 2016, 2017, um, the year Prop 64 was passed, and 2019, 20, 23 of the 28 cities we researched experienced double digit increases in the amount of general fund dollars going into police budgets. And eight of the 28 saw their police budget budgets grow by at least 25%. And overall, the average shift in police budgets for these 28 cities was an increase of 19% over that three year period. So that there were now 400 and more than 455 million more dollars um, going into police, going into the general, uh, going into, I'm sorry, 455 more in general fund dollars going into police um, in 2019-20 than was spent just three years earlier. So those, that's an enormous budgetary shift for such a short period of time. Um, and particularly noteworthy um, given, you know, the long history of similar increases that have been enjoyed by police departments across the state that I referred to earlier. Of course, Canvas revenues by themselves can't account for that $455 million increase. Um, but it's nevertheless clear that cannabis is playing a significant role in the continuing expansion of law enforcement budgets across the state, rather than shifting investment um, into meeting the critical needs of communities who've been most impacted um, by the war on drugs. So just as one example of what this, what this has looked like and how transformative this can be um, for a police department, consider uh, the city of Greenfield home to uh, about 17,000 people in the Salinas Valley. So prior to the passage of Prop 64, Greenfield's total general fund revenues um, amounted to less than $7 million annually. Um, in 2019-20, the city projected over 2.6 million just from cannabis revenue. So uh, many city departments in Green Greenfield saw significant budgetary increases. Um, but their general fund spending on the police department grew by 56% in just three years. So as a result, this small city, which um, had a police department with only with less than 16 FTEs, um, full-time employees in, in 2016, when Prop 64 was 
2017 when Prop 64 was passed, now has 34, um, over 34 FTEs in the police department. So that's a huge jump. So um, as a result of this continued infusion of resources into, into these law enforcement strategies, um, suffice it to say that California's war on drugs has continued to rage on. Um, for example, you know, while there have been numerous major developments intended to roll back the criminalization of drug use, um, including Prop 64 and, and Prop 47 before that, um, California's criminal justice system is still being flooded with drug arrests. In fact, um, in 2018, there were more people arrested for drug offenses um, than there were in 2013, before Prop 47, before Prop 64, right? And, and while the number of cannabis arrests has dropped, the racial inequity within those um, arrests has only gotten worse. So again, in 2013, people of color represented 68% of cannabis arrests, but by 2018, that had risen to 75%. Um, and moreover, beyond the, the 28 cities that, that we studied and that I mentioned, jurisdictions all across the state are pouring resources into specialized law enforcement units dedicated to cannabis enforcement. So for example, Sacramento created a unit of 15 new officers dedicated to unlicensed cannabis. They work with SWAT teams, they raid un, you know, suspected unlicensed cannabis grows across the city, um, and it's a new dedicated unit just for this. Um, and there's many of them around the state. Um, so for example, um, the Santa Clara County has their marijuana eradication team. San Bernardino County has their marijuana enforcement team. These are often very well staffed, um, very highly resourced um, law enforcement units. Um, so just as recreational cannabis has been a major growth industry for, for business interests, so too has it been for law enforcement. Um, um, but fortunately, um, uh, the news isn't all bad. Um, a number of cities and counties have put their, their new cannabis revenues to far better use than simply augmenting police budgets. Um, so there's a few examples here. Um, Santa Ana is dedicating uh, 3.1 million um, in cannabis revenues um, to youth services, including tutoring, internships, youth enrichment programs. Santa Cruz County is investing 350,000 per year um, in cannabis revenue to the Thrive by Three program, um, which seeks to create a, a robust system of care for children and families in poverty. Um, Monterey County is allocating nearly a million dollars, um, last year allocated nearly a million dollars to um, things like early childhood education intervention, a homeless shelter, um, whole person care program. Humboldt County um, uses 400,000 a year in cannabis revenues to fund the Adverse Childhood Experience Collaborative Partnership, which in their words, seeks to address the impact of the inter intergenerational trauma inflicted by the war on drugs and deep poverty in the Emerald Triangle region. But I will say as encouraging as they are, they really just represent the tip of the iceberg of what could be achieved if California cities and counties were to invest cannabis revenues appropriately. Um, as we say in the report, this is perhaps a once in a generation opportunity for a new revenue source um, at the community level that can be a powerful force for public health, for racial justice, for healing the trauma caused by the war on drugs and, and the mass criminalization system. So I'll pause here um, and let the, the real experts who are doing the work on the ground um, talk about what that looks like. Thanks. Thank you so much for that presentation, Jim. Uh, it really does highlight how law enforcement is just grabbing that money to continually crack down on um, marginalized communities, and it's really unacceptable. So uh, I would like to, um, towards the end of this session, we'll have some time for questions and answers. So please put your questions and reactions in the comment section below the video in YouTube. We will try to get to them and we'd love to hear about them. Uh, next, we will hear from the organizers on the ground. We have Charles Reed and Isaiah Tony with the Oakland Emerald New Deal, uh, Cesar Casamayor with the People's Dispensary uh, Fresno, and Dulce Salvidra with Resilience Orange County. We've asked, uh, we've asked them to share with you how they are organizing to get their local governments to invest cannabis dollars in communities of color harmed by the war on drugs and the challenges they are facing with that mission. So let's start with Charles and Isaiah. Thank you, Sarah. I'm Charles Reed from Oakland's Emerald New Deal, which we are seeking to get 100% of the cannabis tax revenues removed from the general fund 
and place in the community equity fund that would dispense those funds back into the community through specialized social programs, uplifting programs, empowerment programs. And if I would, oh, go ahead, Isaiah. Uh, hi, folks. Um, I'm Isaiah Tony. I'm an organizer with In Advance and the Emerald New Deal in Oakland. Um, and Charles is going to um, present a few slides and then I'll hop in later. Okay. Can we get that first slide, please? So we see the Emerald New Deal as an act of atonement for our city's complicity in the war on drugs. So we would like to see the marijuana tax funds be reallocated to impacted Oakland communities. We want to invest in youth diversion. And we want to empower our people through policy change. And this would be a significant policy change and would give our people power. To the next one, please. And these are our endorsers. So far, we have always already spoken to a number of city council members. We have over 20 community-based organizations who have supported the Emerald New Deal because people know this is what Oakland needs to make change. Slide to the next one, please. So we don't consider the Emerald New Deal as reparations. We look at it as restitution. Restitution for the crimes of the war on drugs. All of those people that you see on that picture right there pay restitution. So why shouldn't the city and the counties and the states and this country pay restitution for the crimes of the war on drugs? Next one. And so we would like to see these, this, these funds invested in reentry programs, educational programs that will help our people be armed for, what is it, uh, 2020 and beyond. Um, one of the things that happens is when people come home from prison, digital literacy is one of the most important aspects of them acclimating back into this society. Some of our people don't even know how to use their phones because they've been locked up for so long for uh, marijuana charges. So we would like to see this marijuana money go back into reinvesting our people, rebuilding our people, and make and reacclimating them. Next one. So these are the reacclimation workshops we would like to see for our people, where they learn these skills and they are able to um, get a, a hand up instead of a handout. Next one, please. And of course, our people come home without having a place to stay. And so we would love to see marijuana tax proceeds be invested in transitional and housing assistance programs that lead to permanent housing for our people. And um, this is, oh, go ahead, Isaiah. I'm going to pass it off to you now, bro. <laughs> Thanks. So, you know, there, there are examples around the state of uh, good work. Uh, that's being done to address the, the harm and the crimes of the war on drugs. Um, you know, in Inglewood, um, a, a school that was closed is uh, being transitioned into a, a facility called the Regenerator um, to support formerly incarcerated folks. Um, you know, here in Oakland, um, we, we know that there are folks in the reentry community that are just left hanging. Um, and, you know, because the city of Oakland uh, is responsible uh, for having arrested folks um, and, and, you know, disrupted folks' lives, uh, it makes no sense that this cannabis tax money should go to police departments through our general fund um, and continue to, um, continue to destabilize communities. Um, so, you know, in Oakland, the first year that um, we collected cannabis taxes, um, there were about $14 million raised. Um, you know, moving forward, uh, the estimate's somewhere around $10 million. Um, and that's money that, you know, instead of going to the general fund, um, can support folks uh, to come back and to, to be successful um, and to, to slow recidivism rates. Um, you know, recidivism rates, um, you know, for folks that are supported when they come home are far lower. Um, and, you know, uh, here in Oakland, we understand that part of our work uh, is to address, um, you know, the power imbalance between, uh, you know, police departments and police unions and folks in communities um, who, who actually are under-resourced. Um, so part of our campaign to get this ballot measure passed 
um, is about building, uh, you know, political infrastructure in our communities uh, that can stand up for folks in our communities. Back to you, Charles. Yes. So there is an organizing strategy in what we do. You can't make change without organizing. So we are developing our storyteller squad. We have we are redeveloping our website and our storytelling squad will be people from the community who have been affected, negatively impacted by the war on drugs to help tell their stories, to help move our city council and um, our public officials to do what they should do. And that is to make atonement for their complicity in the war on drugs. You can't, you, you can't just say, okay, we're sorry. You have to do something to make change. And I want to thank you guys for it. And this is where we need that government assistance and collaboration. We have to work with our city officials in order to make change. And we need our city officials to work with us because the people ain't going to stop. And I want to thank you guys. Thank you for that presentation, Charles and Isaiah. You really do need to get um, the community more political power. And so I'm glad you're working on that. And uh, you can see on the slides, you're know, trying to repurpose abandoned facilities to support system impacted folks and other, um, and offer them opportunities and space to learn, grow, and create. And I think that's amazing. Um, next, I would like to give the floor to Cesar uh, Casamayor at the People's Dispensary. Yo, peace, everybody. Can y'all hear me good? All uh, right, for sure. So um, first and foremost, thank you for the opportunity to speak to the people today. Uh, Mr. Freeman, I would love to buy your book and, and continue conversation because one of the biggest issues that we see is also the role of the nonprofits and how they're going with siding with some of the say-so of, of, of city officials that are funded by police. Um, in many ways, we have politicians that are funded by police, and, and that is very controversial and, and, and a little bit scary because... Who do we turn to? Um, one of the things that we've been doing here in Fresno, I'll be very brief, is pushing for policy from a perspective of community first. I understand that I am a businessman, but I'm also a community person that came from the Rockefeller drug laws from New York City. And in Fresno, seeing a lot of the young brothers that I work with um, fall into the trap of survival and doing what they got to do just to feed their babies and, 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 and so on. The story is already too well known. So one of the things that, that I feel is very, very important in the organizing that we're doing and that we've been doing, excuse me, is pushing for economic development. So in the city of Fresno, there was a measure called Measure A that passed. It has five priorities, those priorities being parks, police, safety, homelessness, human trafficking, and infrastructure. Aside from that, there is a 10% of the tax that goes to a community impact fund or community benefit fund, as it's called. That community impact fund is supposed to address the needs of the community. As we started in this, um, in this journey into the industry was from a perspective of community first. So we looked at the taxation. How is that going to be relevant to community? We continue to see that many of the nonprofit organizations, especially those big ones, those big name ones, some who are actually funding these series, um, are getting funding from some of these big corporate um, cannabis companies and setting the narrative for what the needs in our community with very little information from those communities impacted by the war on drugs. And so we need to have a better approach on how we are engaging our community that almost never gets engaged with what they call the yet to reach communities. A lot of times we are seeing that the narrative, the conversation on what are the needs in the community is dictated by a handful of some of these directors and nonprofit folks who have great intentions, the best intentions, but are a little bit detached from the hustle, the grind, the dirty life that many of us have come from or have seen, have lived through, to really have a, a, a true understanding of what are the most important needs. We continue to see nonprofits giving, for example, um, how to start your business, a lot of services, where is the access to capital? So what we're doing in Fresno as a business and as a community is saying that there is a taxation. We understand that the community needs from this 10% should solely go to economic development. And we're, we're defining that as uh, entrepreneurship, employment, and mental health. And mental health for those entrepreneurs that are coming out of the legacy market, as they say, 
which is AKA the black market, but coming into an industry. And it doesn't even have to be through cannabis. We see a lot of brothers and sisters doing taco trucks or families doing small, you know, businesses. We need to support s small economic development for those communities that are always dismissed, that are always disenfranchised, that everybody loves to talk about, but when it's time to put the money where, the, where, where your mouth is, it's almost never there. It's always a service type of approach. And so we need to really look at, and that's what we're doing, we're looking at this taxation to make sure that the funding goes to create economic development for those communities, specifically the African-American community here in Fresno, to be able to develop and have our own self-determination. So as you might call it, um, Mr. Reed, uh, a restitution, we're calling that, we're calling this a small step for reparations because we have seen for too, too, too long the African-American community, especially here in Fresno, be used as a tool to control the narrative of one of the most urgent needs in our communities. And my understanding, and, and this is me coming from, from a humble and understanding my history and where I come from, is that if, if, the, if the black man and the black woman ain't doing right in our community, then everything is all wrong. Um, and so I, I come from that understanding and I push, and me and my business partner, we push for a model, because we represent that model of being genuine and in contact with community, for example, um, some of the work that we've been doing here, it's not just beyond just with the policy from the city level, but also getting a better consensus and building relationships with some of these nonprofits that are in position of influence, that are in position of power. Some of these progressive city council members to push them more into community and give space for people like, for example, um, Tough Kids Outreach out here, which is a small nonprofit organization barely starting. The brother just came out of jail trying to do something right. Fresh United is another group. You have Kids Under Pressure, my, my little homie, um, Opportunities for All. So I say that to say this. We as a community, as a whole, everybody that's listening and, and, and working in, in the nonprofit sector, we need to be better at creating spaces for those that don't have a voice to be able to have space to talk about what are the needs in the community. Because we continue to do these surveys, we continue to do these small numbers, like with all respect, 40 numbers on the third session of the webinar, 40 um, uh, people that, that did the survey, that's a, 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 a fraction of the community needs. Um, and understanding that a lot of, which is beautiful, no problem, 82% I was mentioned in, 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 in one of the, um, the webinars, from the Fulton Dead Survey cater to the LGBTQI youth, 82% of these findings in the surveys. So what about the ones that are gang banging? What about the ones that are in the, in the hustle, in the grind? What about those? Well, how are those voices being lifted? And so we're looking at it from a perspective as a business and as a community organizer and activist to make sure that there is inclusion. And the only way that we're gonna have better inclusion to make sure that we have our communities um, space, to have space and have to have voice, is by changing the way that we're approaching the conversation and, and really being more clear on who is funding who and how that funding is happening. Like I mentioned earlier in my conversation, this is the last thing I'll say. There is companies, corporate companies that are coming into our city that are buying in other ways, um, some of these big nonprofits to help them with their social equity plan. A lot of these, these nonprofit organizations might be dealing with health they don't know nothing about their gang bang life or how to deal with that community. So how are they going to be the voice for that community? And I think this is some of the things, examples that we need to change to, to, to strengthen our, our true sincerity of how we're engaging community and how we're being in community to really have a, a best practical um, approach on how do we use the tax revenue that's coming in from the services that, as I mentioned, from the parks, all that stuff, um, infrastructure, safety, to create a, a, a small pocket, which is just 10% of the 90%, there's only 10% to, to make sure that there is economic development opportunities. And not just in the service of how to get your business and, and, and how to do um, a program, but we need access to the capital. And that's why we, we, we are looking um, to, to, to be in better relationship with, for example, the chambers of commerce that we have in our cities. Those um, foundations that, 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 that give the, the, the trainings, that give the funding. And I think by, by doing that as a business, we show that we are not just the model, this is how we do it, but we're also an example of a good 
um, very sincere, very grassroots approach in making sure that we're doing right by community. We as ourselves have our own um, percentage that we're giving back to community for access to capital to create um, entrepreneurship businesses because that's the only way that we're going to be able to have true self-determination and, and, and begin a, a long out conversation about reparations and how that should look like. There's got to be access to capital for brothers and sisters that's in the struggle that come from that background to be able to 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 continue to build a, a prosperous prosper, prosperous future in, in the country. So with that, um, I would love um, uh, questions and, and, and we keep rocking. Uh, thank you so much once again for the opportunity to speak to the people. Uh, peace, one love. Thank you so much uh, for that, Cesar. I'm <clears throat> just astonished by the fact that we are asking for like a slice of the money not a reasonable amount, which you know we could probably ask for a lot more, just to you know put in our community right. and you know support community needs. And by doing that, we can you know improve so much. And by uplifting you know the black and brown communities that you were talking about, we would we would see less issues with with poverty and violence. And and it's just a, it's a major struggle to just even get a small part of the money. So. Um, thank you for all the work that you're doing uh, in the Central Valley. It is incredible. I uh, want to remind people to uh, write uh, watching to add their questions to the comment section. And uh, last but certainly not least, I would like to turn the mic over to Dulce at Resilience Orange County. Good morning, everybody. My name is Dulce with Resilience Orange County. Um, and first of all, I just want to start it off with um, giving a big shout out to the Santana youth that have led and I've just supported in this um, Invest in Youth campaign. Um, but yeah, I wanted to share a little bit of some of our um, successes and some of our challenges with this fight too with cannabis. In Santana, um, we definitely um, started our fight in um, like 2016, mostly to do work around narrative, like around like why is police getting so much money? Like, why is the city being so irresponsible with their finances? Like, why, like pensions and, and overspending and not like projecting correctly? So we were releasing a lot of this narrative, um, uh, like youth voices of like, what, what can this money be done? And a lot of the things that we faced were definitely there's no money, there's no money, there's no money. So as Jim Freeman was sharing, like the moment like that, like there, this new money came and became available to communities, like it really did open like the doors for us to imagine like, what can young people do? What can young people have? Um, and in 2018, we also started seeing those those money start coming in. In Santana, in 2018, um, we project we had an amount we had 9.1 million come in from cannabis revenue. Um, in 20 um, in 2018, we had 9.1. In 2019, we had 7 million. And this past year, we had 10 million. And next year, we're projecting actually 9.6 million. Um, and our young people through through these last couple of years have been working really hard. Um, our first year that we heard that um, that we were going to get this new money, um, we wanted to work around um, fighting for a youth department. So our young people wanted to have the city focus, like have a specific focus to look and to address the needs of young people in Santana. Um, we know that Santana is one of the youngest cities in the in the country, and we know that um, it's a lot of immigrant families. So we wanted to make sure that the city like was taking into account like the population that made up a lot of Santana. Um, so we started um, bringing people together to really talk about like what can this youth department that the city's gonna host like look like. We were looking at like cities like New York and like out of like the US, like in Canada, and we're like, this is so cool. Like, how are they focusing and providing so much resources, so much research, so much support? Like, how can we bring that to Santana? But it definitely um did not happen. Like I think one of the challenges was that like I think the city the city did not have um, did not have a grand vision that we did, and they kind of just wanted to do like piecemeal throwing of money. We were asking for um, half of that cannabis revenue, so it was nine point one. So we wanted half of it, but they only gave us a third, which was still a big, big win for us. Like three point one million was a really big win for us. So we asked for that coordinator. So our first win for um, in 2018 was to have a youth coordinator to support the city of Santana with um, researching the needs of young people, connecting and networking like nonprofits, like government agencies, county agencies to really provide support. But um, yeah, like I think um, it really, it fell through in the sense that um, I don't think people took it serious enough, like the need and demand of young people, that it, it definitely brought additional challenges. Um, the next fiscal year um, that we started fighting for, for this money was that um, we wanted to make sure that um, 
that the city was actually getting like a vision and, and getting the feedback that community needed. I know that Tessad was mentioning like the cities are going out and getting input from community like, hey, where do you want to see this money go to? And they only get like 15 people. And it's like that is not the representation of the community. And we've noticed that um, in Santana, we are geographically divided between like an older white side of Santana and everybody else. So um, we definitely have been trying to push the city to really like look and research and learn like what is it that young people want like our young people um right now are actually working um doing research um we have um some young folks that have been doing research and talking to the city talking to jim Ketty, to sarah michael to um to city folks and asking like where is this money because they did promise this one this one third of the cannabis revenue and young people have been demanding and asking like hey we wanted to go to youth jobs we wanted to go to jobs for undocumented people we wanted to go to mental health we wanted to go for youth that are falling through the school to prison to deportation pipeline and the answer that we've received all the time is like oh well um the, the like we don't really know what the youth really want and i'm like what like you have youth right here right now like asking you and demanding you like how is it that like you're not listening wow. like they're here in the middle of like city council so um um yeah so the, 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 this last like year that we were able to fight was to give the power for this new youth um, money to go to the youth commission. So we wanted the youth commission um, that the city hosts, which is also just kind of like a, a commission that we definitely need to work on. <laughs> but this commission is made up of young people that um, are able to give um, their voice and decide like what it should go to. But we've also faced additional challenges with that because it's been hard that like, I think like, um, departments have been feeding like different ideas and different needs of young people, which is the new like, um, like a strategy that we want to take, like, how does the city look into a long term solution of like, what is it that young people need? Because just asking like department parks and rec, like, hey, what do you need for young people, which was like, I need new grass like, let's give you some money. Like, I need a new fence post. I need a new basketball court. But I think, like, the young people know that there is, like, deeper issues in our communities that need to be addressed with just right. giving somebody a new piece of grass or a new basketball. Like, there's more. There's more to it that our community needs. So, um, yeah, we've been um, pushing really hard right now, like, with, with the research that the youth are providing to figure out how we can ask the city to create a, a strategic youth plan where they have a vision for the next five years. Right now, this this year that um, that COVID hit, a lot of it um, became like um, like the city pitting community against community. We've been working around um, like affordable housing, around like investment in youth, and also um, universal representation for undocumented families. And it's been it's it's been such a crazy fight because it's like okay, we have this cannabis revenue. Does the youth one third want to give it to affordable housing? Yes or no? And it's like, oh my God, like how are we supposed to pick between like uh, for like providing this space for young people to voice what they need and affordable housing? And it's like, hey, do y'all want universal representation for undocumented families or do you want the youth budget? And it's like, oh my God. Right. So it's been it's been really hard because um they I, they don't have a vision so this year we've been really asking the city to help us create a five-year strategic plan where we are researching we're holding ho forums and 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 asking young people asking nonprofits, asking people that work with with schools people just anyone that works with young people and young people to come and share their vision and voice of what they want to see the city invest um the cannabis revenue because it's just been getting swiped under like it's just been getting swiped by anyone and everyone because it is just general fun and it's additional fun and it includes the police the police have been trying to swipe this budget because now police I guess do community youth work I don't know but um yeah so those have been some of the challenges and we're, and we're trying to get ready for this budget fight like some of our young folks that gotta gotta check in with um youth forward have been able to check in with some of the council members and really pushing forward this youth strategic plan um we're gonna get ready for this new budget cycle but I, we're definitely trying to figure out um like a more sustainable plan like Cesar was sharing like what maybe a ballot initiative how is it that we can permanently keep this money and not have it um, shift every fiscal year because I think different needs come up every fiscal year. Um, but um, yes, so if anybody um, follows us on Facebook or Instagram, y'all can stay tuned with the next virtual budget fights that we'll be going into. Um, and yeah, thank you. Thank you, Dulce, for sharing how Santa Ana um, youth and adults are working together to ensure that cannabis policy in your city is invested in the well-being of marginalized communities. And I know you work a lot with uh, undocumented folks. So 
I know that that is um, you know, a big priority for you, making sure that they get the support they needed. So thank you. Uh, I ha I'm happy now to turn uh, the presenter role over to Jim Ketty to share with you how you can develop an organizing strategy to influence the allocation of local cannabis tax revenues in your organization. Great, thank you, Sarah. I'm gonna go ahead and share a few ideas um, for our viewers on how to approach an organizing strategy around this theme of local cannabis revenue. So one critical question for you all first to answer is whether or not your city or county already has a tax in place and is already collecting revenue. And if you have a tax in place already, what I'm recommending is that the first step is to raise awareness. You know, what we're finding is that people often aren't aware that this is going on and that the lo your local government is bringing in new dollars. Um, secondly, to research how the tax is structured and how it works. And um, Sarah Michael and I at Youth Forward, we, we are very happy to assist local groups who are looking to do research. Um, we can do some of that research for you and with you and with you. So please, if this is something you would like to get into, we're happy to assist. Um, meeting with your local government staff to find out how much revenue is being generated and how those dollars are being spent. Sometimes you can find those that information in public documents. Um, but it's certainly always a good idea to meet directly with uh, city or county staff around that. Um, sharing the information with partners and allies who are committed to youth services, racial justice, and community reinvestment, kind of spreading the word. Again, going back to step one, um, building uh, some consensus and awareness and coalitions around this. Um, next slide, please. And then, uh, of course, a uh, key to, to all of this is developing your own proposal for how you believe cannabis this revenue should be spent and invested. Um, as I, uh, you heard earlier from our, our friends in Oakland and in Fresno and in Orange County, they have done just that. They have developed their own proposals. They're bringing those proposals forward to elected officials and to government staff. And that's a really critical uh, step here. We have to be clear about what we want, because in the absence of us being clear about what we want, of course, the dollars flow to the status quo. And, and we have you know, spent a good amount of time talking on this in this session about what that looks like. Um, in addition to advocating for the revenue to be dedicated to, to your particular purpose, you can also advocate for growth in revenue to be dedicated to your cause. In other words, you know, the, as your city or county continues to collect more and more money, you could ask for the new money to go toward your cause. Um, the cannabis industry is very profitable and revenues are going up across the state. You could also advocate for your tax to be increased. Okay. Um, now I'd like to spend a little time on uh, communities that have yet to uh, put a tax in place. And in order to create a new tax, local governments are required by law to place a ballot measure before voters. If you don't have a tax in place, in many ways you're in an ideal position because you can start right at the beginning and advocate for how that tax should work, right? So similarly with the prior conversation, it's really critical to start off and build a coalition and definitely including elected folks in your coalition, your local city council member or county supervisor who would be an ally for you in this. Um, doing, when you are headed towards a ballot measure, it's always critical to do some public opinion research and see how your local community would react to a cannabis tax and your plan for how to spend those dollars. Next slide, please. Um, part of what you wanna do with that opinion research is determine whether you wanna pursue a general tax or a specific tax. Um, a general tax is one that you're able to pass with voters at a simple majority vote. A specific tax requires a two thirds vote. Of course, the great advantage to a specific tax is that you're able to dedicate those dollars to a very specific purpose that is set in law. Um, but that's something you have to weigh and you know, think about based on what you're seeing and where voters are at. And then work with your elected officials to place the tax on the local ballot. And of course, there's always the option of, of doing signature gathering to place it on the ballot uh, at, through community effort. And uh, at Youth Forward, uh, we recently helped lead a signature gathering campaign around a youth measure. Um, we've also uh, are currently in a conversation with our city council around a, a, a tax on a ballot. So, um, so those are both options. And then of course, mounting a campaign. 
And on the next slide, what I'd like to show you are just some of the resources you can turn to as you uh, seek to figure this all out. Uh, one is, of course, me and Sarah Michael. We're happy to assist you and do, do research on this. Another is a statewide network called Funding the Next Generation that is dedicated to helping local advocates raise funds, particularly for children and youth services. We work closely with them, uh, uh, given the fact that we are in the youth uh, policy field. And then I also like to lift up Getting It Right from the Start, which is a project of the Public Health Institute, also known as PHI. Getting It Right from the Start actually has model uh, can, uh, ballot measure language on their website. So that's another place where you can go to find information. Okay, I think we're gonna move now to questions and answers. And uh, what we wanted to do is kind of tackle uh, the, one of the early questions that came up in, um, the ch in the comment section on YouTube, which is, is there a way in which we can see how much revenue our counties are bringing in with, count with cannabis revenue? And um, as I mentioned earlier, that's certainly something that Sarah and I can help you investigate and research. Um, we'd also, of course, encourage you to uh, meet with, uh, in this case, county staff to determine uh, what's going on with cannabis revenue. Often online, uh, you can find that material on a city or county website, although it's typically from the prior year. Um, but but uh, we're happy to be of support in that area. Um, uh, there's another question here. Is there logic for tax revenue going to police because police have been quote unquote defunded for the past few years? Um, as I think you saw in the presentation that Jim Freeman did, uh, we have seen a steady escalation in police funding over the last number of years. So I'm not really sure where in California you would find police departments having been defunded. Um, and uh, if you'd like to take a closer look at the report that Jim presented, um, you can find that on the Youth Forward website. Um, uh, and we're happy again to follow up uh, with you on that. Um, does anyone have an example of a local jurisdiction that has already reallocated some or all of their cannabis tax revenues from the general fund to more specific use, like reentry? Um, so you did hear some examples. Uh, Fresno's headed in that direction once it starts to collect revenue. Santana's has made some progress there. Um, we have some examples listed in the report. Okay. So for the sake of time, I know that uh, we're get, just coming up on the hour now. I'm going to turn this back over to Sarah Michael. Thanks, Jim. Um, so thank you everyone for tuning in and engaging with us on this topic. We hope you received some valuable insight from the report and uh, local organizers about local cannabis tax revenues. Thank you again to Jim Freeman and our panelists for sharing their research and work with us on cannabis equity and racial justice. As Jim uh, Keddy was saying, uh, we are more than glad to help you um, you know, do some of that research on uh, your local cannabis tax revenues and, and where that's going. So uh, we can do that. The session has been recorded and we're placed on the YouTube channels of the Alliance for Boys and Men of Color, as well as in Forward. Within a couple of days, we will be emailing everyone who has registered for the session, uh, the link to the recording and the slides. And before I close, I'd like to call your attention to our upcoming uh, sessions. We have three more. And, um, and so, you know, we would uh, love for you to attend uh, these last ones. We have public health um, coming up and, you know, regulations uh, to support, to protect young people, and then uh, coalition building, and then um, advancing healing centered and trauma informed approaches, uh, you know, in this work. Um, and so uh, that's all we have for you today. Uh, and want to wish you all a great uh, rest of your day, and we'll see you soon.